Little C. Little C. Uh. <laughs> Should I go with the R? Uh. Welcome to the stage, guys. Hello, hello. Um, essentially, you know, the reason we're sat here for the next 20 minutes is to explore that as music discovery and as music consumption has changed uh, so rapidly over the past decade, uh, you know, that both for the live experience and both for the digital listening experience, uh, we want to explore from three exceptionally informed perspectives um, essentially how that changes the lives of artists and the lives of managers. Um, so we're just going to do a, a, a quick show of hands, actually, in terms of who in the room actually knows specifically what the role of an artist manager actually is. Uh, kind of. Okay, so kind of a, a, a mixed bag. But I guess maybe Madeline, would you like to explain just um, the specific role as you see it in 2017 of an artist manager? It, so it, one more time, I'm so sorry. So the the role that you see an artist manager playing now in the career development of an artist in in the modern age in 2017. I don't, I cannot hear the question. So the role the role that uh, that you see an artist manager playing in in 2017. Ah, uh, uh, got it. Sorry, guys. If you could hear the question, I'm so sorry. I could not. <laughs> uh, so the role I see artist managers playing. Um, managers have become the new label. Uh, we have had to learn to do sales. We've had to learn to do marketing. We basically have had to sort out, because the business has changed so drastically, management teams have now had to sort out how to do every level of marketing and promoting the artist. And especially because we can no longer really depend on physical sales, we really had to figure out how to cause new technology to benefit our artists. That all comes from the management side. The labels are usually slow to that process. And Sol, from your point of view, what, what shifting technologies have you seen over the last couple of years that have had a fundamental impact on the way that you're considering releasing music? I mean, it, it, the obvious one is streaming, right? Like that, it, that it, when it came in, the entire industry was like, and you know, MP3s and everything that happened, and it was like you're stealing music, and now you've moved into, and you could see it coming, but what's happened now is you've got this subscription-based model where people are taking in more, more music than ever before, but then how does that relate to the artist? It's always the question, it's like, how, does, how do you get to the point, and I think that's what happens from my perspective. You know, I had a record deal and I was 17 stars as an artist, a producer, and started managing bands, and it's like, how do you, from an artist's perspective, how are you in the best position to be able to create in the most healthy environment and how are you in the in the best position to then be able to to have a direct relationship with with your fan base which is what yep. you can really do now which makes it very interesting and, and what, what what things are you doing differently now that you wouldn't have done a few years ago that you've found to be incredibly beneficial i mean i just think it's like it's like the power is actually with the artist so even the way that you put your you know as as man was saying it's like the way that you put your team together it's very much it's like you can create a, you don't have to go into like, you used to live off a model of scarcity, so you're just trying to get access to this big kind of behemoth record company that was kind of a mystery. And if you could get access, then you had to kind of climb and try to find yeah. out how you, could, how you could take advantage of it, and it was like a scarcity model. Right now you're in a space of excess, which is, it, which is an, an access because of, because of the internet and because of tech innovation, right? Across the board, it's changing every day. So, then it's almost like you now have your own island where you can kind of create your own kingdom or queendom or whatever it is and people can, and you can have that relationship. Some artists are choosing to just have their music for free. Some people are saying, hey, I can be independent, I can find different financing or you can go to a label. So it's really, it's about kind of uh, that relationship directly to your, to your fan base, I think, has become super important, you know? Yeah. And Josie, um, obviously Sol mentioned this kind of always on kind of two-way street of exchange that artists now have with fans, um, both backwards and forwards that they ne never had before. <laughs> but I imagine when well, I have seen the certain, um, both the positive and the negative side of that, how do you manage that kind of flow of communication and information now when artists are speaking directly to their fan base? Well, I think it really depends on the artist because we have artists that don't do their own social media, so they really see it as a, a platform like a website or a YouTube channel where they just spread the information, which is great. And then you have the artists that actually post the content and make the content themselves and, you know, actually communicate. I have a few artists that read 
every single comment and react to everything. And then, you know, that's the way for them to build a fan base. Uh, What's considered like best web practice for, for artists to be yeah. themselves online, uh, you know, in, in the same way as they are in the real world rather than have kind of two different personas. Yeah. But I imagine it's difficult to kind of balance that communication sometimes if you're not yeah. in complete control of that aspect. But in the end of the day, the, the artists that are very into, you know, doing their own social media, they always ha get a bigger fan base because the fans, they see this instantly. So I think it's, it's great if they can pick that up, yeah. In, t in terms of the authenticity is, yeah. is crucial, yeah. Yeah, people see it when it's like a promoted post, they just engage differently. Um, Madeline, one thing I've, um, you know, I'm sure everyone in the room will have picked up um, over the course of the last few days is um, the conversation around data and how people use data to kind of improve people's experiences, whether it's through technology or whether it's through music discovery and things like that. Um, from an artist management perspective, mm -hmm. how are you utilizing the data? Like, what are the kind of key forms of data that you're um, utilizing at the moment to help you make informed decisions about how you break an artist or how you develop an artist or how you even keep an artist relevant that you've had for a while? Oh, that's a good one. Um, okay, so we'll start with how do you keep an artist relevant? So. I have the great fortune to manage um, an artist who's been in the business for over 20 years. His name is Wyclef Jean. Uh, and when I started working with him, it had been eight years since he had put out a studio album. And so data became the most important part of the process, almost more important than the new music we were about to put out. Because I had to sort, how do you take an artist who last put out an album when people were still going to the store to buy CDs and Spotify didn't even exist yet and now caused people to consume his music the way people consume music today. Uh, and it wasn't easy. And it all came down to data. It all came down to going in and sitting with teams like Spotify and Facebook and sorting out, like digging really deep and figuring out who his real fan base is, the core fan base, who they were, who they could be now. So then you have to look at different audiences. You have to look at interests for the certain kinds of music and sort of sort out, okay, if eight years later, he left the business when he had a huge number one song called Hips Don't Lie. I don't know if we're gonna make another Hips Don't Lie, so how do I find a level of relevance that's gonna not only get records to sell, but also make him be able to tour. And so all of that comes back down to figuring out with, with all of the platforms you possibly can, who the real fan base is, what they're looking for, what they're listening to, meet, learn how to meet people where they are. And, and that's what we did. And so we've got a record out and several of the songs on the new album have already been licensed, Major League Baseball and Google and things like that. And it's all because we sorted out who the audience is. So data, it, it's just, it's critical. And if you can get to it, it's, it's the biggest blessing now in music business, especially from a management perspective, because it's the only way you know, it, even with, with breaking a brand new artist, it's all of the same lessons. It's really sorting out who's looking for what and where they're looking and how do you get there to meet them where they are. And Josie, speaking um, from an electronic music perspective, which is now obviously a hugely influential genre across uh, multiple musical genres, how are you utilizing data um, that you're getting back from the various channels? Well, I mean, for example, if, uh, if you look at David Guetta we work with, uh, he you know, had a big breakthrough about 15 years, 10, 15 years ago, and that was when Facebook got really popular. So it's funny to see that if you compare him to Martin Garrix, who got really big three, four years ago, um, how different uh, um, the engagement is. Like for instance, David Guetta has 60 million fans on Facebook, but has like very little engagement. And it's because by the time when we were all subscribing to Facebook, we had to like say what we like. Like I like playing tennis, this kind of music. I like David Guetta. Yeah. <laughs> but now, 10 years later, all these people, they might not like David Guetta anymore, but they're still liked his page. So it's very hard to find out like, how can we actually read the core fans? And you know, for it, someone like Martin Garrix has a really high engagement uh, uh, percentage. And it's because you know, he connects with his fans immediately. Like he really talks to fans who are there. It's like his, you know, mo most of them are the same age and like the same stuff that he's doing, like to see what he does. Um, so for us, it's always trying to find out what is the new thing. Like with Martin now, we try to, you know, really keep 
tr keep going with his documentary, which we're releasing on a weekly base now, because uh, we feel like people like to see what he's doing every, you know, single day in his weird roller coaster life. Um, and, and is that you saying you've used the word engagement quite a few times? Is that then is that kind of like a key barometer for yeah. you in terms of? Getting, yeah. a, getting a pulse, like picking up on the pulse of how yeah. the artist's relationship with the fan base is? Yeah, because, I mean, you can have 60 million uh, fans on Facebook, but if only 100 people like your post, then it, that means nothing. Mm. So I feel like that's something that everyone should be very you know, careful with. What kind of content do you post? If you only put like promoted posts like, oh, buy my new release, here's my new tool, buy tickets, then people get very... They want to see you also as a person because I feel like. And, and how does how does the utilization of data then, um, like, come into the kind of speaking to you, Madeline? Like, in terms of how you might have managed an artist a decade ago to how you're going to manage an artist in the next five years, mm -hmm. how is data affecting your decision making in that regard? It's uh, so. It a huge effect on my decision making. So new artists, for example, so it's same thing. It's um, you know we inside of the record label because we are a management company and we're an indie label. So we do things a little different than the bigger labels. But um, it's the the data really informs almost everything you do with your artists, the decisions that you make uh, for your artists. It informs what cities you plan to tour them in. Um, it informs on which platforms you should be putting their music. There's certain platforms meant for certain kinds of music. And then there are times where you've got a special kind of artist that you better cover every platform, whether it's paid or unpaid. Like you just want to make sure that you have them where people are consuming that kind of music. So uh, there's, there's barely a decision we make about where music should go, or about touring, or even about what kind of merch to make, if that makes sense. Like, we even take a look at, we realize now when it comes to merch, people don't just want to buy a band's shirt. They want to buy something that they actually will wear all the time. So then you have to start even, you know, if you're doing working with a female artist, as all of my other artists are, um, making, uh, we, they call them baby doll tees versus just a regular old touring t-shirt. But that all comes from looking at what are young women really buying. And so the decisions that you would have previously made on instinct, you're now primarily making on data. That's right. That right? That's right. All of it. And so obviously the, the richness of the data that's available to artists and artists manager now has come as a result of evolving technologies. Yes. Uh, one of the evolving technologies that I think could have uh, a huge impact on the music industry in multiple different ways is, is, is the development of blockchain. Mm. And I wonder, from an artist's perspective, how do you see blockchain influencing the music industry and where do you see the opportunities for artists? I mean, I think anytime you can, you can remove the middleman, right, and you can have a direct connection, which is the same thing you're talking about here, is like you're, you're going to either use, you're going to use data or tech, so blockchain now is gonna, it's gonna change the way we exchange, it's gonna change fundamentally currency, and people in this room and this space know a lot more about it than I do, it's just, but you see it coming into to the industry, whereas you can get from an artist directly to a, to a fan and have that, have that connection and the financial exchange, right? And I think that the, the, what I find interesting is you keep all this, the, the tech just keeps going, right? We keep having progress, but I think part of why we're having like a, a rise in music consumption and touring and all these things are kind of going up and up is because as much as the tech is rolling is as important as the person, the, the actual person to person, the physical thing that we're doing here. And that's where yep. music always does that, right? You can, put, you can put 20 people in a room with someone with a guitar or you can put 20,000 people in a stadium and you have this visceral emotional connection. So there's this combination that Starts to starts to happen where if you're using blockchain, you're going to be able to dialogue with people. You're going to give people a chance to it 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 revol it evolves and revolves. So your conversation is a two-way conversation, and the, from the commerce standpoint, and then from the exchange that happens when someone's on stage. So that's what I'm interested in. Is I'm interested in kind of like the emotional currency and the cultural currency that's cultivated alongside the the, the technology. I think that if we if we rely too much over here, you can start to forget that there's the the engine to the comprehension and the connection point for why people are gathering when it comes to the creative arts and specifically music is to feel and to hear sonically so you can improve all those things but 
it does boil down to like, are you writing great songs? Is the show incredible? Are people telling their friends about it? And then being able to be at all those access points to serve it to people. So if, and if someone feels better within blockchain and they know it makes the artists feel better because they're having that direct connection, that's beautiful because then you're getting away from this kind of, this, this, this disconnection, if you will, you know? Yeah. Um, Josie, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, about the press and, and what you're now striving for as a manager um, in the modern age. And, you know, a, a decade ago, a, a long form feature in a respected media outlet or national radio play or something like that might have been something that you might have seen as pivotal in the development of an artist. Um, I wanted to get a sense from you as in terms of what you think the kind of 2017, 2018 equivalents of that are that you see as absolutely crucial for the positioning of an artist, for the development of an artist or for a breaking of an artist. Mm. Well, I was feel like it's still very important to have the combination of all, so the traditional media and new and social media. I feel that making your own original content now is evolving still, um, especially for artists that you can do an interview in a great magazine and get some good quotes, which can go viral. But at the same time, you can do something on YouTube, which you create yourself and make it go viral yourself. So you have, you know, media wise, you can kind of direct it a little bit more. Um, but I, s I still feel like a, a print magazine for me has a lot of value because it's, you, you can touch it same with vinyl records or and like for example we did a television show with um, Martin Garrix for at Jimmy Fallon which was very special because an electronic artist normally like if, you ha if you're a DJ and you have to perform at a TV, big TV show it's like you press play <laughs> you hear the song and that's it so we find out like we really want to do this amazing show because it's you know, it's, it's a huge thing. Not only the people who watch the show, but especially the spin-off for him as an artist. So the, the PR value was really big. So we got him to play the guitar and did like an acoustic version with the singer on the, on the song. So I, f I still feel there is, you know, the value of traditional media is still very, um, very important. But I also feel like making your own content and creating something for your own platforms and using that as, you know, the biggest media is something that's going to continue to evolve, yeah. And, and what would you say, you know, there was a conversation uh, a few panels beforehand on, on the importance of playlists um, mm -hmm. and, you know, if playlists were replacing radio as the kind of, you know, the kind of the automated tastemaker for the next generation and things like that, how influential do you see playlists now across the various streaming platforms in the development of your artists? Well, it's kind of funny because obviously we work together because you were, you know, for at resident advisor and you guys have very interesting playlists so we always you know as you, as you look at Spotify, Deezer or other streaming platforms it's important to have your own playlist and being placed into other people's playlists to have more people listen to your song but in the electronic music industry it's also about what are the taste making blogs what are the taste making playlists you want to be <coughs> featured in or you want to you know have one yourself um, so I feel it's very important especially for you know electronic Music has been really big, especially the, you know, when the big breakthrough in the U.S. was uh, a couple of years back. But radio airplay, or, you know, is still very little compared to, you know, pop music. Mm. Um, but obviously, a lot of my artists did like, um, uh, they, you know, they did uh, merged into the pop music because they start making songs with vocals and not just a four-minute-long beat. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I would yeah, love to speak to that for just a second. Yeah. Just about how the paradigm has shifted so tremendously. So when you talk about PR and you talk about radio, right? And so we still find artists thinking they need to chase the PR machine and thinking they need to chase radio. But what happens is when you bring a song now to radio, even at mix show level, they've already looked to figure out how many Shazams that song has had. And actually how many Shazams it's had is a part of what informs whether or not they're going to give you airplay. So it just goes right back to data actually has become the most important thing, even to the folks who used to be the ones to break a song. So if, if your song doesn't break by people actually Shazamming it, you might not get the radio airplay. When you're looking for the big TV shows, they want to know what the story is. And what they mean by that is, have you playlisted? Um, do you have certain amount of Shazams? Are these many people listening to your records on all the streaming platforms? So all those folks, the machines that we were chasing, that we thought we needed to chase, 
first are actually looking to see what the management team, the label, and the artists have done on the other side. So it just comes right back to how important that data is even to you being able to get the PR that you need and the radio play that you need. It really has shifted. Cool. Um, we've run out of time, so I think that we can summarize that robots and data are taking over the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you all for your very informed perspectives, and thank thanks you. to everyone who listened. Thank you.